Um, so I am Anthony Horton from the Australian Astronomical Observatory and I'm here today to talk about what I hope is a near future CubeSat mission, um, the Australian Space Eye. So a little bit of context. Um, so it's a proposed uh, astronomical uh, space telescope. Um, uh, background here is this sort of product of the NU's uh, AstroSat initiative. Uh, we heard just before lunch from Mike about the um, satellite testing capabilities um, at the AITC at Mount Stromlo. Um, and the uh, director of the uh, research board of astronomy and astrophysics there, uh, Matthew Collis, found himself with this capability, thought, naturally enough, um, could we do some astronomy research with, with a CubeSat? So in late 2014, a call for um, proposals went out. There was a workshop held in December that year, um, discussing ideas, um, looking for something viable within uh, within the next few years um, that, uh, that could genuinely do some uh, some astronomy, making use of these capabilities. Um, now our proposal um, is also inspired by. Um, some work with small telescopes um, based on the ground, um, specifically um, the Dragonfly Telescope. It's a photo. This is a, a University of Toronto and Yale collaboration using um, off-the-shelf uh, DSLR camera lenses, big ones, uh, in large numbers, to do imaging of the faint outer parts of galaxies. Um, now, these, these, uh, this project has demonstrated that uh, the small telescopes can not only be competitive with large telescopes for certain size, they can actually have an advantage. So here they have small refracting telescopes, they have relatively simple optics, they have very low straight light, and that enables them to see faint extended structures um, in the vicinity of much brighter things like stars and the cores of galaxies and so on. Um, and um, myself and some of my colleagues are currently working on a Southern Hemisphere um, instrument along similar lines with the Huntsman Telephoto Array, which shows a more local uh, invertebrate to name our thing after. Um, <laughs> so here's a, here's a photo of, uh, of the current array um, sitting in the lab. Um, this should be operational at Science Spring Observatory around the middle of this year. Um, so um, that's where the idea came from. Now the aim of the project is Firstly, to expand um, the Australian uh, expertise with scientific <coughs> satellites, specifically in this area of optical infrared instrumentation, um, to demonstrate some, some key technologies that are required for doing astronomy with a CubeSat, which also have other applications, um, in particular, um, highly stable uh, instrument pointing and uh, cooling of image sensors within a, the constraints of a CubeSat platform. Um, and but also, we have to be able to do some genuine cutting edge astronomical research. And that is connected to the last point. We need it to be fundable within existing Australian research grant schemes. Now, we're astronomers, and so we had to be able to, to convincingly argue that this project could be justified on the astronomy alone. Technology and capability development is great, but unfortunately, that won't get us funded alone. We have to jump in at the deep end with something that can really deliver some scientific results as well. Um, so the concept we came up with um, is a uh, relatively wide field, it's about one and a half degree field of view, um, imaging uh, telescope um, optimized for 700 to 1000 nanometer region, um, chosen partly because this is accessible to affordable silicon based image sensors, but um, is at those slightly longer wavelengths where the atmosphere is a real problem for ground-based work, um, which we can avoid, of course, with a space-based telescope. And uh, so yes, this, this is exploiting the absence of the atmospheric emission and scattering, which uh, causes difficult uh, systematic errors. Um, based on the 6 CubeSat platform, um, with a 19 millimeter aperture diameter telescope, about the largest thing you can fit through the middle of a 6 u um, So, the why um, ultimately comes back to these um, key um, astronomy goals. Um, there's a couple of aspects of this, I'll put it long over it. Um, but 
there's two real key measurements here. We want to measure the brightness of the zodiacal light. And the zodiacal light is sunlight that is scattered off interplanetary dust rings in the, in the solar system. Um, and it looks like this. You can see from the ground, if you're at a really dark and clear sky site, um, this is a beautiful photograph by Yuri Kolevsky, and it's this streak across the sky here, sometimes called the false dawn. This is several hours before dawn. Um, so you see this is the plane of the solar system where, where the light is brightest. Um, now, somewhat surprisingly, the origin of this interplanetary dust is still a, uh, something that's argued about, whether it's largely asteroidal, whether it's from comets, um, when the majority of the, this dust was, uh, was generated. <coughs> um, so we'll be using um, the wide field, um, long mission duration, and, and a particular wavelength frame to cover to, to create some detailed maps of this, this dust. And the other uh, aspect is the cosmic infrared background. So this is the combined light from all of the astronomical sources that are too small or faint or distant um, to detect individually, <coughs> which you see as a, as a sort of integrated background light. Um, and this is actually a powerful constraint on models of the history of the universe, basically, of the entire combined light of star formation right from, uh, right from the early, early uh, eras of the universe. Um, it's a very difficult measurement to make, though, because, of course, you've first got to subtract basically everything else from, in the universe from your data. Um, all the stars, galaxies, and indeed there's a dark light. Um, so, yes, um, it did strike me that during the preparing proposal that we're actually proposing an astronomical imaging instrument whose science goals require removing all traces of astronomical objects from the images. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But that's actually not unprecedented. It's it's just the same with the famous cosmic microwave background experiments. They have they have to remove everything in the universe first before they can make their measurements. Um, quick eye suppression. Don't read anything too much into the details. Um, it just gives you a rough idea of the basic layout. So it's a, a six U um, one by two by three uh, cubesat. We'll see the size and shape of a shoebox. Um, oh, well, that's deployable solar panels, a deployable baffle for the main telescope, which runs down the middle, a um, couple of star trackers, uh, and so on. Um, the mic recognizes this coastline. Sydney's edge. Um, <coughs> so inside we have a telescope. Um, it's a refracting telescope. This is part of our um, commitment to minimizing stray light. No observations in the aperture, no reflecting surfaces. Um, using a CMOS image sensor from E2V, which was um, developed for space applications, um, specifically the Seduce mission uh, to Jupiter. Um, and, and the key here is to, uh, to minimize all sources of stray light um, so that we can very accurately subtract all of these um, really interesting stars and galaxies from our own. Um, two main challenges, technical challenges for this mission. One is pointing stability. So for the ADCS, um, we're looking at basing the, we're, we're going to base the, the spacecraft on the Kaivak Endeavour platform. This is an integrated satellite bus. Um, that includes um, an ADCS system consisting of two star trackers, um, three expand gyros, three reaction wheels, three torque coils, some sensors, some pointers, Dedicated processor. Um, it's a high performance uh, ADCS system. Um, flight, uh, flight data shows, combined with modeling, that, that alone this can achieve a stability of about 30 arc seconds, um, 3 sigma. But, uh, but for our imaging, we need to get um, about of order and magnitude better than that. Um, the pixels of our image sensor are sort of about 3 arc second angle on the sky. So we want to uh, sub pixel. Point stability. Uh, so it's quite a challenge. Um, so the solution we, we, we're looking at is a two-stage ADCS. So in addition to the, the spacecraft pointing system, we'll have um, fine um, star tracking information coming from the main telescope. So we use greater magnification there to get finer pointing information using the main science uh, 
image sensor, and uh, stabilization of the image by, by using a ESO x y stage to translate the, um, the image sensor itself within the, within the task set. Um, so modeling says this can, this can achieve the three arc seconds ability we need, provided we've got quite enough uh, stars to train. Um, this isn't entirely a new idea. Um, the uh, JPL NIT Asteria CubeSat mission um, has been working on a two-stage system very similar to this for some years. It's due to launch very soon. Um, and there's at least a couple of others that I've heard of that are proposing a very similar system. So there's basic components of the um, tieback endeavor platform. These are under get. Um, so yes, there's your main config board. You can see the XMCS processes, uh, memory talkers, connection wheels, star drivers. And this whole whole unit um, packs into about a half unit of volume total. Leaves us uh, plenty of room for, for payload. Um, one of the other aspects is thermal control and the image sensor we're uh, using. Um, ideally, we want to cool this down to around minus 40 degrees. This is to minimize the dark signal in the detector. So you're going to absence of light, you get a build of signal and associated noise with time. Um, but it's very sensitive to temperature. We for every six degrees of cooling. So by dropping the sensor to minus 40, we can get, get the performance we want. Um, and the team at UNSW uh, Canberra have done a pre-phase A study for us, doing some preliminary um, power budget and thermal modeling. Um, and, uh, and they concluded that uh, yes, we can do this um, in, a, in a reasonable orbit. Um, so we're looking at a normal orbit kilometers unsynchronous each secondary payload so we won't get into quite that orbit um, but uh, with a with a um, with a uh, radiator panel of about 10 centimeters squared and a baffle um, to avoid IR irradiation from the earth um, we can uh, we can get to this minus 40 provided that we um, we do some IR avoidance your maneuvers um, during our orbit. Um, so this is some results from the modeling, the image sensor temperature um, as we go through a 90 minute or thereabouts orbit. Um, so this is without without IR avoidance maneuvers. Uh, this is with so for a 30 to 40 minute um, observing window for each orbit, we, uh, we get well below the minus 40 um, on the image sensor. Okay, so current status, we have a consortium of six um, Australian universities, Macquarie um, <coughs> University, NMU, um, UNSW um, Canberra, uh, Swinburne, uh, UWA and UQ, um, also the Anglo Australian Observatory, uh, Tyvek in the US and Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, um, and together we put in um, an ARC relief grant proposal that's uh, then to fund construction, testing, launch, and the commissioning phase. Um, about to went in just a couple of weeks ago. Um, using the, uh, the uh, relatively new um, multi-year leaf grant program, um, looking at a total budget of about four and a half million dollars, um, a little over half of which comes from the, from the um, institution, the consortium. Um, with a three-year time scale, so ideally launching um, somewhere towards the end of 2020, um, if they're funded, um, and after that, operations would be um, would be um, the responsibility of Macquarie University, using a new ground station um, on their campus in Sydney, um, and a ground station in Norway, um, which we can arrange access to via our partner Tyvek. Um, looking about a year, uh, mission duration minimum, ideally about two. It's a very small telescope, so we need to look at our targets for a long time, given the third ones. Um, and we should know whether we have been funded in 2017, uh, November, um, usually, um, first week of November. Um, some of you might remember me talking about this project at this very conference a couple of years ago. This is actually our third attempt to get this funded. Um, hopefully, it's that time looking. Um, but yes, we should sort it. <laughs>
question with this one? Yes. Who makes the telescope? Um, we're designing that at the AAO, um, the optics. Um, not decided on who to fabricate that. We've um, been talking to Nikon about it, actually. Um, they're able to do some very high purity and homogeneity glass, which helps cut down the stray light. No local capability yet? Hmm? No local capability yet? Uh, for manufacturing of optics, no, not really. Um, there, aren't, there aren't really any optics left in Australia. I mean, the closest we get was Kiwi Star in New Zealand, but. Um, Um, but yes, the, the actual design and the integration of the telescope would be done at the AAO and, uh, and, and the other larger institutions. Mm -hmm. Great, explain to us, Chico, again.